Sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Am I the only one who thinks this is totally insane? Rob, we're fighting theological injustice here. They're not using just weights and measures. He said we have 50 listeners. I think he's being generous. Rage your Bible is interpreted by experts. Rob, are you as shocked as I am? It's nonsense. If you've given any money to this, you need to complain. You ask for your money back. I don't know about you, but I find this annoying. What up and shalom. Welcome to the Rob and Caleb show. The show where theology matters and scholarship counts and theology matters. My name is Caleb Haig and with me today, a Rob Van Hoff. What up, Rob? How's it going, brother? It's going well. I think for we're in season three, right? Yep. So we coming up in December, it'll be the end of season three. In the beginning of season four, mm-hmm. maybe we should start calling it the Caleb and Rob, and then we instead of show, like a new thing. <clears throat> that th- that would be difficult because we'd have to change everything in like iTunes, man. Yeah, but it's just you know let let people keep them on their toes. <laughs> well, I guess those we'll have who to, ca- those who those care, who care will, will, those will who follow. care will find, find us. All right, well. Something to think about. <laughs> uh, I got to say, I uh, I broke my I, headphones I, right before I, know. I came well, on air. You were saying that, and it reminded me. Say, if, for those who are, have the visual on when we're watching, I guess watching this in the future, my TR mug broke. Oh, it dude, was bad it was omens. in the, it was in the dishwasher next to like wedged against another heavy duty ceramic thing, and anyway, so I super glued it. It the handle broke in two places, so I super glued it. And Jenny's like, "Be careful! If that gets hot, you know it could break. And if you have it on your above your computer, oh, dude, don't even say that." And not, I'm like, not "What cool. are you even saying?" So, <laughs> so what I've done, I thought I'll I'll just be using it for water now. Um, but it, yeah, because it seems water, be, because water on your keyboard is no. Well, I'm not going to hold it over my keyboard, <laughs> but it it seems like it's a good. Uh, a good thing, but I hadn't super glued anything for a while, so I ended up with super glue on a couple of my fingertips. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so nice. anyway, so so your headphones broke, my tour resource mug broke, but I fixed it. Caleb, are, are we in the last days? <laughs> what is I, this? I guess so, man. I guess so. What's going on? Yeah, my headphones. I'm wearing head bu- or earbuds right now, uh, so I'm having a real hard time because they keep popping out of my ears. It's hard to hear. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, anyway, all sense. right. Well, what up and shalom to everybody uh, listening out there. Thanks to everyone in the chat room. We got uh, some our regulars in there, which we love having our regulars in there. But uh, we also have some people we see from time to time. And it's good to have everybody chatting it up. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. What should we start with here? We were going to open up the mailbag today, which we can do. Um, first, now, ha- have you looked at all about uh, at this uh, documentary coming out? The way, Caleb, I can't. I I have to watch my, my doctor said I need to watch my. Uh, blood, is it blood pressure? No, I'm joking. I don't know. I I feel like I just need to breathe when I see things like that, and then just smile and wave and move on. Here's I, the thing: is that okay? Uh, let, let, let me let me let me give credit where credit is due. Now, I'll read this to you because this is on their website. Meet the Creators. Luke, the director, is an award-winning journalist and videographer. And uh, Katie, the producer, is a professional musician and non-fiction writer. We're a husband and wife team. And The Way is our first feature-length film. And they got funding for this on uh, on, um, GoFundMe or some some site Uh like that. Um, They raised over $41,000 with 259 backers. On Kickstarter, that's what it was. Kickstarter, uh, the average donation was uh, 150 bucks. Uh, so obviously, and I gotta say, I was I was interested in this. The trailer looks uh, somewhat interesting. Now, now, there's honestly, 
these people, Luke and Katie, have only, I just saw a very short interview with them. They've only been in the Messianic slash Hebrew Roots movement for, uh, I don't know, uh, a year, year and a half. So they're very new to it, which is, which is great. Uh, you know, there's a lot of zeal there. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, is that, you know, I, I feel like they, uh, they haven't been in it long enough to realize yeah. who they're... Discernment, who... discernment takes time. You know, yeah. you can't accelerate discernment. Discernment is something that you acquire over the long haul of, of uh, wrestling it out, of staying in the Word, being in community, being reading books, having co- lots of conversations with people, praying, losing sleep being on your face before the Lord, you know, I mean, you got to do that for, for a long time and you, you slowly, you know, we grow in discernment that way. It, it's a problem in general is that the, our capacity to produce media, like good looking, attractive media, whether it's video or text, you know, websites, um, is way, uh, exceeded people's, you know, capacity to really soundly, present the scripture uh, in on the rock, you know, uh, built on the rock. And so what happens is just like with, you know, any kind of thing like that, even in the music world, you know, all of a sudden everybody can have music production software. That doesn't mean it's all great music, but it just means the world that gets flooded with, with, well, look, let's let's give let's give Luke credit. The cinematography and everything looks really good. It looks like they really, you know, he knows what he's doing. You can tell. You know, you can tell. Yeah, but that's he, not. Co- but that's not core content. I know. And what people are going to say. Uh, pe- that's, what that's, are, what, yeah, but what people are going to say is, oh, here go Rob and Caleb down and, you know, something they haven't even seen. Here's the thing. OK, now, when I first saw the trailer, I noticed they got Brad Scott in there. Uh, Brad Scott has emailed me and told me he is not two house. I I'm sorry. I mean, you might not like the title, but looking at the stuff that he's uh, put out and the people that he associates with. I. I I say that I have to say that he's two house. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I... Um, and then you got, uh, you know, you got Zach Bauer. You got uh, um, who's who's the uh, who's the guy who calls himself an apostle. Anyway, I'm, he's on there. I'm, two house as well. You know, so, so what, bunch... what's the what's what's the point? What are okay. they doing? Are well, they they're selling a selling? A, they're casting a vision of no, no, messianic. No, what, no, what they wanted to do it, basically. Uh, they're asking a couple of questions. Basically, they're seeing what they're calling this, like, uh, I forget, uh, what do they call it? A revival or something to the biblical festivals, biblical Sabbath, all these kind of things it, within the church. And so people coming out of the church realizing, you know, and they kind of almost down the church in the, a little bit in the, in the, uh, in the, tr- in some of the things that I've seen. But, and that kind of turned me off a little bit. But then I think yesterday, the day before they released a video, or maybe it was even before that, but they released a video of behind the scenes and they're interviewing Michael Rood and oh. it totally ruined it for me. So, okay. So that again, we have good intentions. Obviously it sounds like they've got oh, they good have intentions great, yeah. and, and it's, and Arthur I'm Bailey, sure. Arthur Bailey. Thank you. Chat room. Arthur yeah. Bailey's the guy who I was thinking of. And they also got Rico Cortez. We, you know, we've, gone back and forth with Rico. I still think Rico's two house. He, he admits it. I, I hope that, that this is a good, uh, for those who watch it, this is just a good uh, conversation starter and gets people in the hopper, you know, in terms of filtering down. Um, well, for, for Luke and Katie, I, you know, I see what they're trying to do and, and, and their efforts, you know, good for you. At the same time, I have not seen one person that I, that I, in, in the, in the lineup that, uh, that I think, wow, scholar, or, you know, even people I disagree with, you know, J.K. McGee, where's he at? Uh, yeah, I think, I think scholar, quote, scholar has a bad rap. We've probably done that, Caleb. <laughs> I, I don't it. think I'm a we've, scholar. We I'm not a scholar. Dude, I'm a, I'm a loud mouth. We've ruined it. <laughs> You've ruined it, man. You've I've ruined, ruined it. it. <laughs> um, but no, I, you know, I, you know, I'm not trying to down anybody in the documentary in terms of, you know, I like Zach as a, as a person. I disagree. Well, it with him reminds on a lot me of, of uh, who was the, the, the academic, um, oh, what's his name? Michael Heiser. Was it Heiser who, who, who uses the layers? He says, you've got like the, the academic or like the scholar, and then you have the popular, um, middle earth. He says, you know, the pop popular middle earth 
producers of, of books and movies and things. And those are people, they, they kind of are aware that there's the scholarly world, but they don't really interact with it that much. But they know that something's up, and so they're rising up to lead, to try to have a leading voice, you know, to get people around ideas and concepts um, from the people that have no clue that there's the, the scholarly level. And he calls that the Middle Earth, um, using the Lord of the Rings <laughs> idea. Um, and he put Chuck Missler there. So Chuck, in other words, you have a leader who has the ability to market ideas. They know how to get a radio show out there. They know how to, to produce a, a talk sh radio show to get books out there. They tour all the, over the world. Um, but they're not scholars and, and they, but they get a big audience because there's people who want to know the people on, uh, what we call the lay people, the people who aren't necessarily engaged in the academic or scholarly level, um, still have a desire and thirst for God's word, just like we all do, like, like everybody does. Who are hang, born. hang on just a sec, Rob. I'm going to change headphones here. Hang on. All right. Um, I'm filling space right now, everybody. So, you know, Caleb's, uh, doing, watching him shuffle things around. Um, anyway, so the, you know, the body of Messiah needs nourishment, needs, needs food, right? Needs spiritual food, which comes from the Bible, right? That's a basic thing. Um, so there, no one's disputing that. What, what happens though is what does that imply? What does it mean? How do we get the word of God from the Bible into the mouths of us, the individual members of the body of Messiah? And that has to go because of the nature of the deal where we live. We've got languages, we've got culture, we've got history, we've got uh, uh, polemical or disputing ideological commitments. We've got pro-Yeshua, we've got rejection of Yeshua. We have 2,000 years of this. Um, and it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to sort through for the serious disciple of Yeshua who wants to, to grow and and start to grasp these things, it's a narrow path, and it's going to cost you your life. What I mean by that is it's a lifelong commitment to, to, to start on that path and to commit to it. That's what I think they're trying to say in the, in the documentary, though. And here's the thing. Look, the chat room says, I'm afraid the scholarship of J.K. McGee leaves much to be desired. Lovely brother, though, he is. Now, I, now I might agree with you, but the point is, is that J.K. McGee has, uh, you know, he's done hard work hard work he's gone to school he's gotten his master's you know he's he's worked hard what well, i brought him up because i disagree with him but you know and i'm saying why couldn't they have have uh at least gotten some people who have some education not to put down the people that are in the documentary but you know where's uh ariel uh ben Le uh, levy or uh, lehman i'm sorry ariel ben lehman or where's uh ariel berkowitz or uh you know my father where's tim Hague? now granted if my dad was offered you know if they contacted my dad and said, Hey, would you do an interview? The first thing you'd want to do is know who was in the, in the documentary. If he sees Michael Rude's name, the answer is no. And I don't understand why these guys, why is Zach Bauer and, and Rico Cortez and all these guys, why are they just fine f casting their lots in with people like rude? Maybe they didn't know. I, I mean, I don't know any of these people. I mean, I've had the brief interaction with Rico. Um, Oh wait, I, I, I was at a wedding at Michael Rood's, uh, Michael Rood's daughter's wedding back in like 1999 or something like that. And I think he presided over it. And um, so, but I haven't. Uh, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, is that, you know, I hope, I hope, oh, I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. Answer it. Let's put, let's put it on air. Say so you are now on air. <laughs> um. You know, I'm not this, trying, I'm not this, trying to put Luke and Katie down. I'm sure that they're, that, you know, like I said, they're new to this. They, you know, in my mind, there's a little bit of naivety there because they, it's like they're new that, you know, maybe they haven't, they haven't had to work through all this stuff. So it's not a put down on them. No, it could be, it's just naive. And that's what I mean. It's like discernment takes a while and, and you know what, hopefully, you know, that, that if, you know, they're true disciples of Yeshua and over the years they will grow in discernment by the leading of the Ruach and they will produce better and better and better material. That's, that's what I hope. Yeah, maybe but I, probably, do, maybe I, I don't think maybe I don't think I'll watch the movie. I I will because we'll have to talk about it on this show. Okay, you can watch it. <laughs> um, you play me the clip. 
yeah um maybe they'll do a way part two the way part two uh in a couple of years where they where they uh realize that the hebrew roots uh is kind of off in left field anyway um okay well we do have some mail uh let me see if i have do i not have my mail bag oh man what is happening right now okay well um adam adam says brand building is important for a lot of ministries yeah no doubt okay hang on uh, i gotta find something real quick i'm sorry dun, 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 dun. you're listening to the <laughs> rob and caleb show please stand by as Caleb solves the world's technical glitches. We will be back with you shortly. Okay. Um, now I don't even know if this is the right clip, but we're gonna we're gonna try it. We're gonna, we're gonna try it. Here we go. Let's open up the mailbag. Mail time. Mail time. Mail time. Mail time. Mail time. Mail time. Here's the. Okay. Yeah. That's that's how we're gonna use for now. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone to the mailbag. Let's take a look at what we got. We only got two of them. And actually, one of them is from somebody in the chat room. So thank you, Yvonne. Yvonne writes in, she says, uh, well, I should put this on the Facebook page. If you guys, uh, if you guys want us to talk about stuff on the air, you put it on the f Facebook page. Uh, she said someone posted the question what they talking about. She's uh, making reference to uh, First Fruits of Zion. We've talked about them for the past, what, two shows? Well, no, 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 because we did an interview. Anyway, we've talked about them on and off for the past, you know, within the past month. Uh, she says, uh, someone posed a question to them, that is FFOZ, what they meant by traditional Judaism and asked about oral Torah. This was the response. Thank you for finding this, by the way, Yvonne. This is great. This is from FFOZ. They say, quote, the oral Torah refers to the... Do we know who, do we know who, who responded? Uh I don't. Uh, Yvonne did not put it in the uh, in the email. However, uh -oh. she's in she's in the chat room. They're over in England, so I think their delay is more like forty five seconds or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, I'm sure once she uh, hears this, she can tell us whether or not there was a name on it. Uh, they say, "quote The oral Torah refers to the dialogue and commentaries of the ancient rabbis of Israel on the meaning and interpretation of the written Torah of Moses." These musings and community rulings were preserved primarily in what is known today as the Mishnah and the Talmud. So uh, this, okay, this in and of itself has its own problems because there's there's more stuff from the time that the Mishnah was was compiled and, and finally put out uh, that was going on. You know, are they, when does it stop? You know, at what yeah. point, what time, at what point was there, was there uh oral Torah canon closed? And and that's something that they don't answer. And it's like, they don't want to answer it. And I understand why, because I don't think they have a good answer for it. Okay. Anyway, let's keep going. They say, uh, quote, when we say traditional Judaism, I, somebody, whoever asked this question has to listen to our show because these are the two things that we keep pounding them for. Uh, when we say traditional Judaism, we refer to the sects of Judaism that fall into some stream of orthodoxy, which is to say that as a sect, they maintain a high regard for these sources as a guiding light for their faith and practice. Aaron Eby provided a breakdown of some of these sects in his lecture. Thanks for your question. I hope this helps. Uh, someone named Frederick, Frederica, Frederica uh, did it. Okay. Um, so here's the thing, this, this term traditional Judaism that they're using now, uh, this is such a vague, vague description of what they're saying. And what it does is it lumps together Orthodox Jews. And actually I, I'm a little confused on Aaron Eby's presentation. I, I watched the whole thing. We'll talk about this later, but it seems to me what I got from it, maybe somebody can correct me here because I, may, I might be completely off on this. What I got from Aaron Eby was that we have to have a, that Messianic Judaism has to have a, uh, basically a, a, a Jewish hashkafah. And that can range from all sorts of things, from reform 
uh, all the way up to Orthodox. However, what he his final what it sounded to me like he was saying in his final uh, few minutes there was that uh, actually Messianic Judaism can't really have the Hashkafa of like a uh, reform uh, synagogue, but rather it has to be Orthodox. We have to have ha halakhic. We have to have halakha, which he never defines, but it seems as though he's talking about uh, uh, oral Torah. Basically, we have to be centered on oral Torah uh, to be able to be legitimate. Is basically Here, here's a thought. Here, here's a thought. Okay, in the book of Luke Acts, right? If we assume that Luke and Acts was written by Luke, right? And it's like volume one, volume two. Um, Luke opens up his gospel saying, there was a lot of stuff being told about Yeshua. So I went and interviewed a bunch of people so I could set this, you know, so I could give you a clear picture of what really happened. Right. So Luke, the very beginning of Luke's gospel is that there's a lot of stuff going around in the air. Right. That people are telling a lot of stories. And Luke says, I'm going to go and interview and I'm going to gather data. So he's going to get oral testimonies, right? He's Luke's the only one that tells us about Elizabeth's uh, prayer, about Mary's prayer, about uh, Zechariah and all that, right? He, he interviewed probably those people and the families and got firsthand accounts, oral, oral accounts, and then put those into the gospel continued on, told about Yeshua, but Luke wasn't there for any of this, right? Luke, in, in the book of Acts, I think it was right around Luke 16, all of a sudden he says, we. He starts using, we did this, when he joins Paul. Now all of a sudden, Luke writes himself. He's part now, firsthand, experiencing this. Like that's the last, you know, handful of ch 10 chapters or so of the, of the book of Acts. So why do I point this out? Because one could argue, oh, well, Luke Acts is, an, is a codified text of oral, oral traditions about Yeshua. But it's not just, it's not just oral tradition uh, blanket. It is oral tradition that's been sifted and tested, right? There was stuff that I, I guarantee there was stuff that Luke heard about Yeshua and stories he heard that people said, don't, don't, don't buy that. And that the Ruach HaKodesh guided him to know sure. what to, because we know there's the Gospel of Thomas. There's all sorts of stuff written about Yeshua that, that we don't hold as canon. Sure. And that was in the air, or people were t talking about that, and, and it was being written down secondarily. Okay, so you have this massive oral lore about Yeshua. And I'm just using Luke Acts as an, as an example because he tells us point blank right at the beginning of the gospel that he's going out and he's going to tell he's going to sort what to what to believe and what not to believe for us. And he's going to tell us. And that's what he does. OK, so and then we call that scripture now. That is scripture for a disciple of Yeshua. OK, now. What what well, I'm hearing when we talk about Mishnah and Tosefta and Talmud. We have a similar thing that happens, right? We have all these oral traditions that different rabbis were teaching. They're different Mishnayot, not the Mit, but Rabbi Kiva had his circle of disciples, right? Rabbi Ishmael had his circle of disciples. This is all in the second century before the Bar Kokhba revolt and there, uh, you know, up to that point and beyond. And they weren't, they didn't agree with each other on different uh, ways of doing things. By the end of the second century, so around the year 200, give or take, you have the figure Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the, uh, the prince, who— Wait, was, where are you placing him? He lived around the end of the second century. Okay, keep going. And he was, a, by all uh, accounts, seems to have been well-to-do, and he was in good connection with Rome, he had good relations with Rome. And he was in a position of power, and so goes the story, and this is debatable on different details, but basically the, the story is that he learned, he did a similar thing that Luke was trying to do 100 years or so before, well, 150 years before. As what the he's story doing, he goes. goes <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my, that's my caveat. <laughs> he, so what does he do? He takes all these different traditions, and he anthologizes them, but he puts them in a specific order and arranges them in a specific way and 
and is said to be the, the codifier of what of the body of official halakhic uh, uh, rulings and practice called the capital M Mishnah. And then that becomes a, basically like a new scripture because the Talmudim, both the, the Talmud, meaning Talmudim, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, are extensive commentaries focused around unpacking the meaning of the Mishnah of Yehuda Hanasi, and which is like which is in Hebrew, right? The Mishnah is in Hebrew, the Gemara is in Aramaic, and and in those discussions, they're mentioning mentioning okay. other okay. Hebraic traditions. But what's the point? Why am, the yeah, point is the this. Point? The point is this. They're saying that they want that sifting of oral stories to be authoritative. Well, the, yeah, but have the, an authoritative okay. place. But the, but, but, the, my, but the story that you just told is essentially Jewish folklore. There, we have no proof of any of that. So it's it, it's not even. No, wait, wait a minute. We have the we have the we have the Talmuds. We have the written not, Talmuds. Yeah, but, but we don't have anyone. Here's saying, a point. Okay, okay, here's, here's my point. Here's my point. Is that it doesn't exist. Well, there's many points packed in here. The oral Torah, so-called, doesn't exist for these people as oral anymore. It's written. Yeah, you're right. It's written text. And it's, yes, the it's oldest— It's become the, sacred text. It's become the, sacred text. It's, it's un, they're not going to change the Talmud. It's not like, it's not like they're going to—and so, you're right. That there's, what Caleb's getting at, everybody, is that there's a, you know, textual difficulties with manuscripts, dating of, of Talmudic— Jerusalem versus the Babylonian, codification of the Mishnah, how was the Mishnah received originally, um, we don't even ideological have, so we, differences we, between the Babylonian and the Palestinian Talmud. All those things are up in the air. But what I hear in, among Messianics, I, I, would, I would be surprised if they are studying these script, these I call them scriptures, these written texts that they uphold as oral Torah, in the original language, I, I wonder if they are even studying the original language. I studied Hebrew for many years. I studied Aramaic for many years. I've studied Talmud with a rabbi. I've studied Mishnah with with Jewish uh, teachers of this stuff. It's not easy. It's not easy text. This is the, uh, I wrote a paper on something that depended on the Zoharic Aramaic. That's the Aramaic of the Zohar is not easy. Okay, no, and, wait, and I my no. my point is this: is that I think these these written texts are being translated into English, and then people are reading them, and they have this like aura of uh, of authority around them, like oh wow, but they're not they're not seeing it clearly up front. You know what I mean? That's that's my suspicion. You 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 touched on it for a few seconds there, though. I, ra I, I rambled a long time. No, but that's fine. Here, here's here's what I'm getting from this. They they say when when we say traditional Judaism, we refer to those sects of Judaism that fall into some stream of orthodoxy, which is to say that as a sect they maintain a high regard for these sources as a guiding light for their faith and practice. So what they mean by traditional Judaism is all different sects, including the ones that believe in reincarnation, the ones that believe that Israel shouldn't be a state, the ones that believe, uh, you know, th there's all sorts of uh, orthodox uh, Hasidic uh, sects that completely reject uh, sound biblical doctrine. And they're not talking about that at all. They don't want to talk about the mystics or, or the mystical, and they, they kind of do. They bring up uh, Nachman and these kind of guys. But they're not they're not telling people, oh, yeah, let's have a conversation about why all these guys believed in reincarnation. Let's have a conversation about how these guys, re, you know, uh, believe in tran in trances or amulets or, you know, all these kind of things. None of that is 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 talked about. That's what's disturbing to me. Are who who was the one who made the comments about the sects? Aaron Eby. He's you. Did he define. You know what he means by the word by the word sect? Or did? Oh, who, who uh, you're asking? Who made this this comment? This is Fred Frederica. Um, oh, and, about this different sects. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to go back real quick. I'm sorry. Somebody in the chat room. Uh, back to the way documentary. I'm sorry. I, I saw this a long time ago, but I, I want to comment on this. They say I think the movie will be a good start point. Uh, st start point to have conversations with others. They have people in in there I don't agree with, but baby bathwater. 
Yeah, okay, I agree with you. It might be a good start point. Here's the problem. What about the person who is in the Christian church who's maybe on the fence, doesn't know, but somebody comes along and hands them the documentary the way? What is the what what are these people gonna see? They're gonna see all these two housers, they're gonna see all these guys, Michael Rude, they're gonna think that these guys are quote unquote messianic. They are the level of, you know, they're on the level when it comes to uh Hebrew roots. Now, I'm not saying the Lord can't use that. I think that there might be some really great things that come out of this documentary. What I'm saying is, is that these are not the good representations of, of messianic theology. It's, it's just not. That's the problem. This is the people that I see in this is is Hebrew roots. Now, granted, there are some really great people in here in terms of of personality, but you know, and 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 loving the Lord. There's no doubt about it. There's some people who really love the Lord in this documentary. I don't doubt that. I'm not putting these people down like that. What I'm saying is that theologically speaking, are we going to you know, am I going to hand somebody a a uh, a documentary that has Michael Rood? And, uh, you know, Brad Scott and, and Rico Cortez and, you know, all these guys that are that I disagree with theologically. I, I, I don't think I can. I certainly would not with Michael Rood. I would not. Well, I think it, I think, Caleb, I think charisma plays a role. I think there's I think there's something to be said about the social idea. And it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with a, a person who, um, for some reason or another, they are attractive you know, they have an attractive, uh, maybe appearance, voice, uh, way of speaking, um, and and people are drawn, get drawn to that, and that's that's the nature of charisma, and I think that's um, it happens in different religions, it happens in politics. Okay, wait, hang on. This is, uh, this, this is a good. Now, uh, I, I agree. Somebody in the chat room says, if God can use a donkey, he can use the Hebrew roots movement. Absolutely. God can use anything he wants. But when my child says that uh, he's thirsty, when my three year old says he's thirsty, I'm not handing him strychnine and saying, well, God will God will quench his thirst and, and uh, preserve him. That's not what you do. Just like someone who's in the church who has questions about these things, I'm not going to hand him something that has Michael Root in it and say, here, watch this. Why would I oh, do Robert, that? Robert has a good point. He says most of these people, most people already see these people as leaders of the movement, quote, yeah, using yeah. scare quotes. And I, I think what is, it's a good point, Robert, because um, if you see the number, basically, <laughs> it's like, it's like American Idol. <laughs> you know, we, what we do is we'll watch the market for a year. We'll see who gets the most, who's getting the most uh, hits. And then we'll put those people in a movie. Then our movie will definitely at least I have an initial a warm market. Okay. I don't, now see, that sounds that sounds. Does that sound pretty mean of me I, to say that? I don't think that that's what's actually going on. I, I mean, I, maybe there's parts of that in there. In other words, or is it that the 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 producers are naive and so they just assume that the people that easily came on their radar must be the ones that represent. And maybe uh, it's yeah. I think truth. that that that's more. It, and I think it's also might be that that look. There's no doubt Michael Rood, uh, even though he's a false prophet and a false teacher in my mind, and I think according to the scriptures, he has led people in, into truth. There's a lot of people I know who say, yeah, I got started with Michael Rood and then I realized he was totally nuts. And now, but you know, he's the one who brought me in. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's totally fine. So uh, these people are probably the same. They, they, they came into this movement a year ago. They see Michael Rood. They see all these people. They say, oh, this is great. Okay. And then they, they want to make a documentary about it. I think that their heart is absolutely right. I think mm, that, Eve, uh, did you see Eve's comment? She says, I find it frustrating out. to go to studies where people quote from these people and I cannot disagree without causing an argument. That's she's captured something there in that statement that I've experienced yeah. firsthand. And I've had um, and I feel like I have to almost learn the skills of a politician. <laughs> like I had I, I had a. A gal came to, I teach Hebrew Monday nights locally here, and a gal had contacted me, said she wanted to come. I said, sure, come. Well, right while we're getting ready for class, in front of the class, she asked me about what do you think of blank ministry? And I was like, I felt kind of like a deer in the headlights. And I'm like, well, you know, I kind of said, can we talk about it later, you know? And then after words we kind of talk about it and then there's people standing around listening and I'm like okay how do I I felt like I was asked to walk a tightrope like on the spot and and what Eve just pointed out here this idea is like look I need to give you some clarification 
of why I believe what I believe. I'm not judging their heart. I said, you know, I said, you need to trust the Ruach um, if you're consuming material from this uh, institution and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, but I understand the problem there. Um, I felt like I needed to do a little bit of a political dance because this is a new person. I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I guess I could have said, you know what? Can we meet another time? Maybe, you know, we'll chat. Uh, now's not the time. I don't know. So, yeah, even our, our brother and colleague here, uh, Gary Springer, who works at Torah Resource with us, he got started with Eddie Chumney and Joseph Good. <laughs> so, I mean, the Lord can obviously use whatever he wants. And I pray and I hope that the, that uh, that uh, the Lord will maybe use this documentary to not only bring people to himself and, and uh, show people light, but I also hope that maybe it'll be a good journey for uh, the producers of this, uh, Luke and, and Katie, uh, or Kate, I think it is. Um, you know, I, I, I pray that they, that they will be able to uh, learn some good lessons from it and uh, maybe do some kind of follow up. OK, let's keep going with the mailbag, because this we had a we had an interesting before we came on air. Uh, <laughs> we started diving into this question, just looking into it. And I said, we got to save this for the show. This is too good. OK, here's what our uh, a gentleman named Jason wrote. And he says, uh, we have a friend who has sadly begun to observe a sunrise to sunrise reckoning of the day. Now, I, I, I get these people all the time. No, no joke. I mean, we get I get emails all the time of for, people for the sunrise to yeah, sunrise. sunrise to sunrise. Like, what do you you know, or even a sunrise to sunset. It's like they're trying to do a sunrise Saturday morning to sunset Saturday evening. Anyway. Um, so he goes on, I have easily been able to respond to the majority of his quote proof, but I wanted to run two passages by you from the Septuagint that I could use some help with. I don't read Greek and I don't want to rely on English translations of the Septuagint. Good for you, sir. I would really appreciate some help with this. Good job, Jason. I, yes, I have to ask for help, especially when I'm looking at Hebrew texts. Okay. He says in a nutshell. He, that is his friend, is is maintaining that the Masoretic text in uh, Nehemiah 13, 19 and Judges 14, 18, which I've put the English translations in your show notes, everybody, uh, were altered to reflect the sun down reckoning and that the Septuagint shows sunrise uh, being significant, not sunset. Do you have any insights on this that you might be able to share? Okay, so um, now... Full disclosure here, I, for some reason, and maybe Gary can help me with this after the show, for some reason, I don't have the Ralph uh, Septuagint text uh, in my Accordance library right now. I don't know why. Um, anyway, I do, so I'm using the sweet, I'm using the uh, sweet Sep Septuagint. What do you have open, Rob? Well, I have a, the <clears throat> Ralph's is the more critical. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I usually use I usually use Rolf's, but but uh, for some reason it won't come up. Here, here's here's one way to I, since he's probably not using Greek, he's probably looking at the the translation from like the 1900s or the eight probably the 19th century. You're talking the, about the Septuagint, the, the Brenton, yeah, that's eight, I <clears throat> that, 1851. So um, in the 1851 translation of of the Septuagint. You said Brenton uh, translation? It's the Brenton translation. Okay, I got it. And it <clears throat> it says before sunrise. You're looking at the, are, are you talking about Judges or oh, Nehemiah? Judges four Judges fourteen eighteen. Okay, got you. <clears throat> so he's reading this as on the seventh day before sunrise. See, but I see that in the Greek. Yeah, because it's the Greek. It, it's a one ancient Greek text. We have another that the Rolfs is based on a, a, a stronger textual <clears throat> tradition, and it has before the sun went down. I agree with you completely. So, in yeah. other words, we have Caleb's having a coffin fit here. That we have Sorry. multiple, and this is why it's important. Uh, just like we have different translations, it would be like you and I are reading different English translations of the Bible, and I say, "Well, it, but it says." You know, he can, he's all foods, he called, made all foods clean in Mark seven nineteen. And you're like, you're reading the King James you're like, Oh no, it purges all meat, all foods. And we're like, no. Okay. Well, 
we're dealing with a, transla- a discrepancy between ancient translations. We're not dealing with the Masoretic text. Well, and that's just it. I don't but this under- person is suggesting that the Masoretic text is wrong because one of the Greek translations has something different, right? That. But that's but that's I just think. but yeah I, I agree with you but I I just don't understand what evidence at all you know I I tried looking up the the Hebrew of these passages in the in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and of course the Dead Sea Scrolls don't have these you know it's missing this these passages but what proof do we have at all that uh, that that the Masoretic uh, text or the Masoretes changed this passage and why would they do that? Well, I mean, yeah, what we, we, we have no proof whatsoever. So what you're saying is, is that that the sept, that, that would one, be me. That would be it's, it's. I mean, this is exaggerated, but it's like actually, God didn't create light until the second day, but the texts we have are corrupt. Yeah, it's corrupt. But I don't. Ha- but then you ask me, well, how do you know? Well, I just because I, except in this case, he has an he has a, a translation that seems to support. His view, no, but no, the context let, let, is not the Shabbat. It's it's the study. It's the story of uh, Samson. So, in any event, um, for those interested, I don't even know if we did justice to our listeners. Judges fourteen eighteen. There's this phrase in the Hebrew, "Beterem Yavo Acharasa," and the the Charasa is one of the rare words. To mean son, Harris. It's like only used twice, I think, once here and once in Job. So right off the bat, you're using a, a, a text that has a very rare word in it. But Yavo, it will come, and Bo, the word Lavo, to come, is throughout the scriptures. When it's used with the Shemesh, with the sun, it means the going down of the sun. It means sunset. It means I just sunset. Saw, it doesn't I, mean sunrise, it means sunset. I just saw your co- comment. Do you need to kill a spider in your? I already got it. I already got it. <laughs> it was crawling uh, on the wall there. Okay. It was freaking me out. Okay. Um. So <laughs> now I see. Now okay, we're talking about we're talking about uh, which translation is this? What English translation were you using? I'm sorry. Oh, I, I think the guy's using the Benton, which is but, the okay. one from 18. 18- Okay, so so in the in the Benton, it looks like they're following uh, the the Septuagint's uh, tr- the translation, Sweets translation. You know, he he represents that because Sweets text, yeah. The one you want to use is the there's a N E T S, the New English Translation of the Septuagint. It's available for free online, and it's got awesome introductions to every book. I mean, we it's in accordance. It's a module in accordance, but you can. I'll see if I can find the the website. Okay, but no, no, but, but but here's the point: is that is that um, in the Benton, I I understand why he would get that in Judges fourteen eight, but in the Benton, I don't see it in Nehemiah thirteen, thirteen nineteen. It says in in the Benton translation, it says, and it came to pass when the gates were set up in Jerusalem before the Sabbath, that I spoke and they shut the gates, and I have orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath, and I set some of my servants at the gates that none should bring in burdens on the Sabbath day. It, 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 does it keep going? I don't understand. Hang on, let's Yeah, let's, I don't know. I, let's go through know. 21. Let's see what it says through 21. So all the merchants lodged and carried on on traffic without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said to them, "Why do you lodge in front of the wall? If you do do so, again I will stretch out my hand." Uh, from that time, they came not on the Sabbath. There, there's absolutely nothing in the Benton that would make uh, that would make him him believe, in my opinion at least, that uh, this is a sunrise the sunrise Sabbath. And in the Septuagint, in the sweet tra- uh, in the sweet translation, the Greek sweet tra- translation, the only thing that I can imagine is that it would say "kai a geneto," but. Uh, um, I just, don't, and it was. yeah, that's, and not, it was, I don't understand how he would get, uh, like the sun coming up. That's it, just the via he in Hebrew. Via he. So, and it was, yeah. but I'm, but what, what does the Ralph's translation have? Because in the ESV, they, they have, as soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, where, so this must be from the Hebrew, obviously they're taking this from the Hebrew and probably the, yeah, Mad, they're both, Mad. they're both a little strange that the Hebrew is that, that it was growing dark. 
at the gates of Jerusalem. So the ro- gates, the, the, literally, it's when the, as the gates of Jerusalem grew dark before the Shabbat. That's the Hebrew. And that's what the, the uh, Rolf's edition of, of the Septuagint has as the, the, the main text. But we have, to re- we have to remember that when we're de- the Sept, there is no one Septuagint. There are, we just have multiple different manuscripts that are all Greek translations. And some of them, a lot of them agree with each other, but there are some variants here and there. So, yeah, to, to Jason, I mean, the obvious question that I'd have to ask this gentleman would be, what proof do you have that the that the Septuagint or that the uh, that the Masoretes changed the text? We don't see that at all, even within certain translations of the of the Septuagint. The Septuagint, various translations of the Septuagint don't have have uh, what uh, what the Benton translation is is uh, representing here, at least in Judges fourteen eighteen. Now, I'm not sure where he is getting anything in Nehemiah 13, 19. I, I don't see it in any of the Septuagint texts that I've pulled up. I could be wrong. Yeah. It might be somewhere, but I sh- sh- certainly have not found it. I've never uh, really heard a, any any whiff of a, of a compelling argument for that the day starts at sunrise. That's because there isn't one. <laughs> so, but people are cha- making life this is where, you know, where theology and exegesis translates into practical life, right? Application. I'm going to modify my behavior sure. because of the way I'm reading this and that link between a text and your practice, you know, and somehow they're making that connection. Somehow there, someone's helping them. Connect. It's like with the Lunar Shabbat. Usually, you know, there's someone advocating it in a compelling manner. So other people follow, um, but yeah. Okay, so you know, I was, I have like, I don't know, I have like ten clips pulled from Aaron Eby's thing, but I don't even think that it's worth getting to. To be honest with you, it's. Let's do. You want to just listen to one? We could do that. And before we do that, the one thing that I wanted to ask you about was, I see that you are. Uh, for those who might not have seen the tour resource mail out. Rob Banhoff is teaching a new course this coming this coming fall quarter at Torah Resource Institute, and it looks very very interesting. Um, I put I think I put it into uh, into the store, and I have neglected to I forget exactly what. So it's called um, Jewish Mysticism: History, Text, and Practice. <laughs> T- talk about that. I want. I'm, it's, it looks very interesting. Yeah. Well, it's a for those. It, it it's going to be kind of a scary course in that it is very reading intensive. I mean, basically to to cover this in a uh, this topic in one quarter is is the task, right? That's the challenge. It, the, for uh, those who for those who might not know, if you take any course from Rob, it's extremely reading intensive. Every course that I've taken from you is like, oh, okay, well, we have this week read 150 pages uh, from this, and then uh, you know 25 pages from this is like, dude, what is going on? Yeah. I, so when you no say way to... when you tell me that something is reading intensive, that's scary. But uh, they're all really good because you get through so much literature. Well, we have three. There's and and I I try to put that in the description so people can see. Uh, and there's a responsibility of writing response papers along the way. Um, so, and, and so, but in any event, we're doing, there's three textbooks. One is the classic um, Gershom Sholem's Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, which was written originally in like the 40s. Um, and so, of course, someone who's written a book in the 40s that has stood the test of time also has its critics. So we'll be talking a little bit about what do scholars today, how do they understand Sholem's worldview and how he was talking about the Jewish mystical tradition over 2,000 years? Um, Sholem, Sholem makes a lot of equations. Basically, he calls Kabbalah kind of like a Jewish Gnosticism, right? Uh, kind of okay. a Gnosticism, Gnosticism revisited in, in Jewish garb. Um, and he, he goes down. And there's other things uh, involved with, with Sholem 
in terms of where he was in history, which the the rise of Zionism in the late uh, 1800s and um, and his reaction to German Jewish scholarship of the 1800s, stuff like that. Anyway, so but that's his major work. Uh, it's called Major Trends. And if you if you don't take the class, I would you know get the book and read it. Um, then we're going to read a brand new book by an Israeli scholar, Professor uh, Boaz Hus, Boaz Hus, and his book it's called Zohar. Um, or the Zohar, it's called, what is it? Reception Im- and Impact. Reception and Impact. Brilliant, brilliant scholar. This book was originally written in he- modern Hebrew, but the Littman Jewish Library, or Jewish Library Publishing House, uh, translated, they had a team of translators to translate it from Hebrew into English. Excellent book on uh, the reception of the Zohar, the Jews that, rejected it, the Jews that pushed it, how it uh, came to be uh, an important text since the Middle Ages. And then we're going to read, and that's a pretty intensive reading, we're going to read a book uh, by another Jewish scholar of mysticism, uh, Lawrence Fine, whose book, uh, who's written a lot on Isaac Luria and uh, Lurianic Kabbalah. Um, so Lawrence Fine's book is, is called Safed Spirituality. It was written in the 80s. Excellent book. It talks about their practices, their texts, but also their asceticism. What's the point, uh, though? Why, why, why? Okay, we talk, we've talked a lot about Jewish mysticism on, on this show, mm-hmm. but what's, I mean, what's the, uh, what's the goal and in then, the course? Oh, with, the, with the course, and then with, with these three textbooks and all the supplementary readings, we've got a lot of other readings that I'll be providing. Um, students, the, the goal is for students to come away with a framework for for understanding and being able to think intelligently about um, what we call, quote, mysticism in the Jewish tradition. Um, And for disciples of Yeshua specifically, to to see the variety of and and repetition of things that, um, and these are from Jewish scholars, this is not uh, from Christian, you know, view of things. Sure. Uh, things that we need to be aware of and to be warned about. Um, and I, that's, that's one, one big aspect of it is that I, the, re, the reason we need this course, I believe right now, um, is because of the, um, irresponsible and what I believe is, is, um, naive, and romantic, uh, like desire that I see in, in certain messianic teachers out there to integrate Kabbalistic, you know, Jewish mystical concepts into their teaching about Yeshua, and it's it's mixing, you know, in, in my view, it's it's mixing things that should not be mixed. Um. For one, because it's one is poison, right? It, it, exactly. It has no place. But also to show, you know, we want to give a good sense of chronology and historical development, you know, so that people will be um, uh, more aware of some basically basic trends in in Jewish history, more largely, you know, over the last 200, 2,000 years. And then also kind of points along that timeline of how things developed, ideas that that entered in and became popular. Um, and so when we see that timeline, that chronology, we can then guard. It helps us to see, oh, when I'm reading the apostolic writings, I need, all that stuff doesn't exist. You know, that's not there. Uh, even though that there's teachers out there that are trying to tell us pushing it, that, yeah. that we need to read the, the gospel through the eyes of rabbinic Kabbalah yeah. or that we need to read the Bible through the viewpoint of oral Torah. You know, that, uh, so this is another class along with Judaism to the first century and introduction to rabbinic literature and uh, um, foundations of contemporary Judaism that my hope is to, to provide that kind of background. Yeah, it looks really good. I, I don't know. if Here's the unfortunate thing is that I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to take it this quarter because I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to get Greek under, under my under my belt before I move on. Um, yeah. 
Well, it sounds super interesting. Okay, let's move on then. Let's go to some of what Aaron Eby has to say. Now, as I said before, I uh, I was confused a little bit at the end of this, uh, you know, what his what his overall point was. I think what I got from it, I think what I got from it was that he's saying that uh, essentially what I think he's saying is that, that uh, Messianic Judaism has to have an Orthodox Jewish Hashkafah. And now he says that in a lot more words than, than I do. And I don't think that he would, maybe, maybe that's wrong. I'm, I'm willing to say that I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, here are some of the things that I pulled from him. Here is, uh, okay. He talks about uh, the, well, yeah, okay, here we go. So there are many reasons why halakhic standards are necessary in Messianic Judaism, just as they are necessary in other Jewish communities. Number one, the Torah is a national founding document. The Jewish people are a nation. The Torah was given to them as a national, civil, and ethical code, not primarily as a personal guidebook to life. This founding document sets in place the basic structure and principles which will govern the people in its land. In the U.S. government, our closest equivalent is the Constitution. The Torah does not anticipate all of the legal situations the nation will encounter, but it sets in place the structure and leadership and values which allow the Jewish nation to adapt to those situations. He says Jewish nation here. I, I stopped it before it's over. He says Jewish nation. The Torah was not given to, the, to a Jewish nation. It was a mixed multitude that was at, at Sinai. That's the, that's the first the first thing that I, that I hear is, I mean, he yeah, keeps, the Torah was given to a people that would be led and taught by Kohanim and Levites. Yeah. There were, there were, well, here's the other, and here's, it, here's the other right? thing. He, he, yeah. He, he, he uh, tries to say that it's like akin to the, the constitution. I don't want to get into politics here, but I had a buddy of mine tell me, you know, I bought a house last year and uh, I had a buddy of mine tell me, Oh yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, property taxes are totally unconstitutional. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, if, if you don't pay your pro property tax, then the government will take away your, your property. They'll take away your house. So you don't really own it. The government will take it from you if you don't pay your taxes. To me, that's essentially what, I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to say that the, that the, uh, that the Torah is like the, the constitution, well, then the oral Torah is like property taxes, <laughs> if if we think of it that way. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's binding on me. You're saying it's binding on me, even though it has nothing to do with the founding document. It's laws that you're heaping on, on me that uh, don't need to be there. So he's not going to, so he's not going to say that it is obligatory, but he's going to say it. I, has a function. No, I don't get that. I think that that uh, basically from if you take all of these different lectures that FFOZ did uh, that they recently put up on their on their YouTube, if you take all of them together, I think that what they're saying is that it is obligatory. It's uh, it's the person. This is Eb. Is he do do we know is he a gen messianic gentile or messianic? He's Jew? Jewish. He he lives in Israel. Okay. Okay. Um, here's the thing though: is that I think that the Torah was given to uh to the nation but once again i i believe that that we don't have to have this uh, this blanket statement that he uses halakha which i'm taking i guess to mean oral torah but i don't think that that uh, it was meant that we were supposed to have a standardized it's different from community to community and that's the point is that look if i go to one community and they say well we have uh, red tzitzit with a blue string in it, and mm -hmm. we tie them this way. What am I supposed to do if I start going to that community? Now, is that is that Torah? Uh, is that specified in Torah? No, the answer is no. But to be part of that community, I'm going to conform to that community. Now, if I go somewhere else and they say, "Well, we use white thread with blue with a blue, you know, white strings with a blue thread in it," am I? And we tie it this way. Am I supposed to conform to that? Yes, because the Torah doesn't. You know, it's different from community com community. When you standardize all of it, you're making halakha. You're making you're making laws. Okay, no, yeah, but here's the thing, Caleb. What they're saying is that 
let's say the temple's destroyed and you have all these different Jewish groups trying to interpret their own way. He's, he's suggesting that the, the rabbinic tradition is the one that God has blessed to be the author, authoritative voice and to basically be the federal government of practice. I understand right? that's what he's saying. I just don't, I think that, I just don't think it, it has any foundation. Well, I, I, it, it has, you mean foundation from a, from a disciple of Yeshua perspective? Yeah. He, he, I think that people who believe the oral Torah is from Sinai, they believe they're on, they're, that's a faith. That's a, that's a pillar of faith for them. Just like for a Mormon, the pillar of faith is that Joseph Smith is a prophet. You know what I mean? It's like, they, they adopt this particular belief, and then that belief becomes a foundation for their worldview, their hashkafa. Yeah, but uh, here's – okay, here's the other thing is that the, the guys over at FFOZ are not stupid. They're, you know, they, they're sharp guys. I have to assume that they know that the Mishnah, quote-unquote, Mishnah and Gemara that is found in the, uh, the, you know, the, in the early manuscripts that we have have all sorts of discrepancies. Yeah, the, but they but – they, they're not coming from a textual scholarship perspective. They're coming from a social, what has worked socially. And what has worked socially is we don't debate about minutia of the text. We just see that there's a synagogue of Jews that have been living here for, for a hundred years. And we want to be part of that community. And so we're not going to make waves. We want to just adopt their halakha and be part of them and be post-missionary, right? Post-mission. We're not here to mission. We're here to practice rabbinic halakha as our lifestyle. We're not here to tell you about Yeshua. If somewhere along the line I tell you about Yeshua, maybe, maybe not, but I'm here to practice. Do you really think that that's Judaism. what's going on? No, I on. think that's what that's what post-missionary it means. But it do means you think that, that they're they, adopting it as a lifestyle now, and we're not we're, we're not on mission. The Great Commission is is not an issue to the Jews. What, what, what Jews who believe in Yeshua are to do is to adopt rabbinic halakha and be part of the rabbinic communities. How and, is it, but how, how do they get around the Great just, Commission? How do, how do they get I don't around know. it? Well, and how do they preserve a sacred text that is that is rejected by the, the institution there, or, you know, the communities they join to? I don't understand that. Uh, they, they're, they are basically, this is, you know, no, wait, hang on. No, they're you, saying you, no. You, 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 you read uh, Kinzer's post-missionary Messianic Judaism. Yeah, yeah. So, so why does he think that 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 we're post missionary? Why, why, what reason does he give that we're no longer to evangelize? He because basically, the church has a lesson to you know the church needs to learn because of all its atrocities towards Jews. I mean, he's using these big, huge terminology. You know, he's not talking about Christians that gave their life to save Jews. He's not talking about those guys. He's talking about the Inquisition and the Holocaust as. Um, Expressions of Gentile Christian hostility towards unbelieving Jews, and that Jewish believers in Yeshua have to separate themselves from that and say, "Look, we're going to identify with the people of Israel. We're going to identify with like the the victims of this, and we're going to adopt their practice of life. And we are post missionary. We're we're." We're not, we're not doing it. We're not doing it as an outreach. And this is the distinction because, you know, chosen people, ministries and others, they will, they keep, you know, Shabbat festivals and they invite, you know, Jews that are maybe secularized or Jews that are maybe disgruntled with the Orthodox life. They come in and they feel like they can identify, but the gospel is being preached. They're hearing the gospel, but that worldview is rejected by Messianic Judaism. That's that is like messianic mission. That's Christian missions to Jews. You see what I mean? That's Christian missionary to Jews. Christians adopting Jewish practices in order to bait Jews and convert them to Christianity. Okay, but that's so, what so, that's, so, but, 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 they're saying that's over with. Okay, so wait, wait. But are, are the, now I'm trying to give FVOZ and even Kinzer uh, a fair fair shake here. So are they saying that we don't keep Torah as a as a missionary uh, endeavor? But we that doesn't mean that the Great Commission is gone. We still have to give the gospel to people, but it, we don't we don't keep Torah to try to to try to do mission work. If that's what they're saying, then I agree. We do Torah because it, it, that's how God sanctifies us. But we should always be preaching the gospel, right? 
And don't you well, think I the think, FOC would agree with that? I think that they, uh, well, here's the thing. Let, let, to the degree that that worldview wants Messianic Jews to adopt, um, to encourage Messianic Jews to adopt halakha as a way to positively enhance their Jewish identity and connect with other Orthodox Jews, um, and maybe in so doing to have opportunities to talk about Yeshua, they are also wanting to clear the ground of Gentiles that make noise in that arena, right? Because if, if you have a bunch of Gentiles who are wearing seed seed and are not under any rabbinic authority, that muddies the water for, let's say, an FFOZ, right? That, 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 inter, that brings noise into what their effort is to connect with those Orthodox communities, whatever that looks like for them in Israel. I have no idea. I haven't been there to see what that's like. I don't know. Um, but, but it also, it, it's, they feel like they need to answer for it. And so in their need to answer for it, they need to, to cast a vision for the Messianic Gentile. And what it looks like is something different. Go back to your churches, let the Jews be Jews, let Christians be good Christians, and we'll all do our best to get along. That's the way I understand it. I, I could be totally wrong, but I, you know, I've, I have thought about this a lot, and I've, I've read publications from these different groups. Um, what I see is a, a, the rigor of biblical theological engagement with the scripture is, is missing in my view. Um, and I see a desire for social, it's in a way it's like a social engineering. Um, let's, it, we need to have an official conversion under rabbinic authority. We need to, uh, shun intermarriage, you know, prohibit intermarriage. Um, and we need to somehow connect with the Jewish people as a whole uh, by adopting, or but, but what they mean by that is not just any, they're going to use rabbinic halakha as the standard, as some sort of God given, if not divine, I don't know if they're going to say it's divine, but they're going to say that in a way that God has smiled upon it and has therefore accepted it, um, and adopt that as official life practice, just for the sake of preserving uh, their perception of a, of a Jewish identity and that Gentiles don't have a place in that unless they do the, unless they go according to Holocaust, unless they're born of a Jewish mother or they convert under Orthodox, um, authority, they don't have any business. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think you know, that's my understanding. Well, we, what, what you, uh, we, we certainly can't get into this now. I mean, we can't go farther <laughs> because we would spend another two, two hours talking about this. Um, no, I, I think, I think you, you're probably right. And there's a distance. One other point, there's a distancing in, in the drawing near to rabbinic halakha. There's a simultaneously fleeing from or distancing from reformed slash evangelical worldview and almost calling Protestantism as bad, those silly Protestants, and upholding the Catholic Church yes. as like as like the parallel institution. So the Church and Israel are the rabbinic and legal halakhic uh, hierarchy and textual uh, history of the Jews versus the legal and hierarchical hierarchical archical and textual history of the Catholic Church. No, and no, those I, are the two pillars. No, I see that in I see that in Kinzer, for sure. Kinzer comes yeah. straight out and says says that. But do you see that in FFOZ? Because I haven't seen FFOZ. What I see in FFOZ it, with the Boaz's book, uh Tent of David, is that there's no voice to crit the only critique to bring to quote quote the church is that of persecution of Jews. Um, because he was saying, if you're this, you know, if you're this kind of Christian, go to that church. If you're that, if you're Baptist, go there. If you're Nazarene, go there. If you're Anglican, go there. If you're Catholic, go there. And you can even, you know, Catholics have a have an oral tradition, you know, a sacred, uh, extra biblical tradition, just like uh, you know the rabbis do. And and so, you know, I don't know if they would push it as far as Kinzer. But I do see the distancing. There's a distancing in FFOZ from Reformed tradition. 
They're not going to quote Calvin. They're not going to quote Luther. They're not going to quote Spurgeon. I, I would, I wouldn't imagine it. I mean, I could be wrong. Show me if I'm wrong. But I, I hear a, a desire to distance and not quote those sources as as valid. Um, oh, okay. That's my take. And I'm uh, I'm one man. I'm limited. I agree with you. Okay. Um, well, this has been fun. I think we're going to end here. Uh, please, we really enjoy your uh, your emails and all that kind of stuff. And if you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to leave comments for us, please do so on uh, the Robin Caleb Show Facebook page. Uh, that's where all of our comments are going to start going. So uh, yeah, uh, comment there. You can also send us emails. Send us emails at c h e g g. That's c h e g at torahresource dot com. And yeah, it's been fun. It's been real. I hope that everybody has enjoyed it. Um, but we do want uh, some new topics. So if there's something that you have seen out in the in the sphere of messianic slash Christian that you want us to talk about, please let us know because those are the kind of things that fuel the discussion here on the Rob and Caleb Show. You can uh, disagree with us. You can agree with us. Whatever you want to. And it's all good. Okay. Anything else before we go? No? I... Uh, I hope that uh, everybody has enjoyed this, and I hope that our discussion here on The Robin Caleb Show does one main thing. That is, lift up our great God and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. <laughs>